Okay, we'll keep things going. David Myers is a senior project specialist at the Getty Conservation Institute, where he has worked since 2001, and is manager of the GCI's recording and documentation unit and part of the buildings and sites department. He now works on projects developing the Arches open source heritage inventory and management system and on research on applying consensus building and conflict resolution methods to cultural heritage place management. In the past, he has worked on GCI projects in Jordan, Egypt, Southern Africa, for Iraq, and in Los Angeles. He received, <laughs> he received a Master of Science in Historic Preservation and Advanced Certificate in Architectural Conservation and Site Management from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master of Arts in Geography from the University of Kansas. Welcome, David. <laughs> All right, thank you, Maggie. And um, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Um, I'm gonna be shifting the conversation a little bit from surveys to focusing more on inventories. So, um, but before I do that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the organization that I'm from and what our what our impetus has been behind creating Arches, which um, is a system, an open source software platform that's really purpose built for managing uh, cultural resource source inventories. So, as Maggie said. Oh, I'm trying to trying to advance. Might need to click within the window just to get it going. Okay. Try it now. Thank you. Um, as Maggie mentioned, I'm here from the Getty Conservation Institute. So um, we're based in Los Angeles. We're part of the J. Paul Getty Trust. And um, uh, most people, know, when they think of the Getty, they think of the museum. Um, but we're, the Getty Trust is actually made up of four different programs. And my my program is the Conservation Institute. So we're really focused on advancing um, uh, practice in conservation of cultural heritage. Um, and that's re really um, internationally. We work internationally. And so our work is really oriented more toward um, professionals and also organizations that are, that are responsible for conservation of, or protection of cultural resources, cultural heritage. And um, some of the things that we do are trying to address um, gaps in, in the field that, that we hear about from the field. And um, I'll explain how, how this led us to, to invest in developing arches. So our partner in developing arches has been World Monuments Fund, which is um, based out of New York. And our our missions are, are pretty closely aligned. Um, generally, um, we're motivated by helping to pr protect um, cultural resources internationally. So, Arch is just in a nutshell. Um, I've got this kind of working working definition up. It's a modern uh, open source software platform that we we developed with World Monuments Fund. Um, and it's purpose built for organizations to manage inventories of cultural resources. And um, I'd like to get into, you know, we've heard about surveys, what the difference is between surveys and inventories. So, um, and, and I find that it's pretty frequent that I hear kind of um, people referring to the two things synonymously. And um, just based on experience, I see them being very different. Um, so first, surveys I see is really data, data collection efforts. I mean, there are, there are other kinds of data collection efforts. You know, it could be through remote sensing, using satellite imagery, or other means. But they're really, you know, disc discrete activities that are over a certain time period. And a, a large survey, you know, if you look at an individual resource, a survey might um, record conditions at that resource just on one one particular day or over a couple days, perhaps. And 
the end result, you get data, um, but then perhaps in 10 years time, a lot of that data might, might be seen as old. So whereas an inventory I see is really an ongoing record that um, it, it needs to be updated over time. Um, it, it, you really need some sort of authoritative uh, record to go to, maybe looking at the status of a, of a property in terms of maybe designation or evaluation, you know, in terms of, for instance, National Register or Cal California Register requirements. Um, and it, an inventory may um, kind of take in data from, from many surveys over time, but it, it's really uh, an ongoing record that needs to be maintained and you, you need to have it kind of supported. Um, ideally, you're gonna have an information system, some sort of database to, to manage data instead of a survey might produce, you know, lots, lots of files um, that may be separate. So let me, let me um, get into, so why were, why were we motivated in developing ARCHES? Um, it really goes back to some experiences we had um, related to Iraq over a decade ago and we, with World Monuments Fund, we were we were trying to develop a national new national inventory system for this National Heritage Agency of Iraq, which they did, they didn't have. Um, we ended up shifting shifting our efforts to Jordan, and we implemented a uh, a system for Jordan, a new a national inventory system. And through that experience, we started hearing over and over again how different, especially government organizations, both here in the U.S. and internationally how they were struggling with um, information technology and inventory systems and uh, being under-resourced and a lot of them having older, older databases or um, not having information public, all these kinds of issues. So that led us to believe that, you know, there's a real need in the field here. So that led us to invest together in trying to develop a solution. So why are inventories important? We've heard a bit about, a bit about that earlier from uh, our earlier presentation about surveys. Um, so, you know, one is just dealing with development and needing to know, um, is this where, where this development plan is planned? Do you have significant cultural resources? Uh, are, they, are they designated um, or has a survey even be, been carried out for that area? Does a survey need to be carried out? Um, also, being prepared for natural disaster. Then you really need information very quickly, right away. This is showing Hurricane Katrina, which is a bit over 10 years ago. And I think everyone knows the, the tremendous impact there, where you had much of the city basically underwater or inundated. And there was a a large scale survey carried out there because really there wasn't an existing inventory in place um, that, you know, like FEMA through FEMA funding or so on. You know, you had people out assessing buildings and what building buildings need to be red tagged and demolished or so on. Um, and there was data existing primarily for historic districts in New Orleans, but not on an individual property level. So then they had to scramble and carry out a large scale survey. But ideally you would have an inventory in place where you could respond more quickly. Um, and another need is just for the public to be aware of, um, I mean, this, this is showing what might be considered an archeological site um, or it might be a community, considered a community resource, but you know, if you're a property owner or you're considering buying a property or a developer or so on, just knowing the status of properties. And ideally that information can be made publicly available. Of course, there, there's certain sensitive information that you don't make public, publicly available, but ideally you have, you have that information already and you can provide it to whoever, whoever needs it for, for decision making. 
And one of the one of the trends that we've heard about is that um, you know there's there's fairly often funding made available for survey projects. You know, it might be through CLG grants to gather new data, but very very often also there's not support for the long term management of that data or making that publicly accessible. So you, you have all this focus on gathering data and um, or you might have legacy data like this, um, you know, might still be paper, might need to be digitized or from a number of surveys over years, you might have data on hard drives or whatever kind of media, but you might not have it um, all combined in one format, in one system that's searchable across the data and so on. It might, some of them might be in proprietary formats and over time there might be issues with accessing that data. So these are all challenges that we've, we've heard about or issues that we've heard about that we're trying to address through Arches. So really, you know, these inventory systems, they're, they're really needed, they're really essential. It's kind of, kind of like bread and butter for you know, a city, a county, a government agency, but again, they're often lacking in support. For one thing, software is um, often expensive. So, and we all know how um, government agencies, the public sector, you know, funding has, has been, um, been dwindling. So that's not a good combination. Also very often, um, well, this, this is a point about, um, you also have, you know, separate government agencies who are independently spending money on developing systems for themselves, but they're kind of investing in, in these silos and um, looking, at, looking at the big picture, um, a lot of them, they're, they're addressing very similar needs. You know, there might be some particularities that are, that are a bit different, but um, they're, they're making individual investments that we felt like if there could be uh, a, an investment for the field, as opposed to all these individual investments, that, um, that there would be a lot of benefit to that. We, we've just felt like, you know, there's a lot of money wasted because of investment on, on the micro scale to do the same thing. And of course, as we all know, how fast information technology, you know, is is changing, and um, you know, it takes it takes time and expertise to be able to stay up with the current technology. And we've also found that, um, and I've seen surveys showing that in the in the preservation field, that very often it may be preservationists who are the ones who wind up ha having the job of being responsible for databases or developing databases and things like that. And that may not necessarily be their area of expertise and they may have limited time to devote to that. Um, and, and, you know, we, we see it really being critical that this information is managed and protected and available over the long term. You know, there have been surveys that have been carried out over decades and and really, you know, on one of those hard drives, you might have a decade of, of effort invested by multiple individuals. And um, if, if that data isn't looked at over the long term and really thought about making it accessible over the long term, it's at risk. And, you know, data, data is being lost. So again, that, that's why we decided to make this investment for the field. Um, developing arches um, and these were some of our key requirements in developing arches and um, I think quite a few of them respond to those particular challenges or issues that we identified first it is open source which means the software code is free um, and also the software code is modifiable so it's not it's not closed software code um, you could hire um, a um, software specialist to customize the code for you, um, and it's completely open for you to do that. 
I don't know if you'll cover this later, but what yeah. um, what code uh, is it written in? Uh, the, the, the primary programming language is Python. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a, a software developer, so um, I'll, I'll kind of at a high level um, cover um, what, I, what I'm able to. If people have more technical questions, I can refer people to places where people can answer those. Okay. But, um, and it's developed with what's called a Django framework. Mm, okay. Um, which and is D-J-A-N-G-O. D-J-A-N-G-O. <laughs> um, and, and there's also um, JavaScript. Um, so we've developed it in a generic way for the field, but it's also customizable. That was my point about the software code. You can, you can modify it because we know that, you know, different organizations have particular requirements and, um, as we've heard here, we have a lot of people from California, and I believe there's someone from Washington State. So, you know, you might have different requirements based on the state that you're from, or um, there's the National Register and so on. Um, also, under the open source license that Arches is comes with, um, improvements to the software, um, if you improve the software, you're obligated to share those improvements with, with the community. Um, we see that as a good thing. Um, we've also really um, investigated a lot and, and put a lot of thought into structuring the data so that it is um, readable and usable in the long term for the future. Um, so for, for example, the, the data is not put into some proprietary format, um, but they're um, open formats. Um, for instance, you can export it as CSV, which um, you know, is not proprietary. Um, and, and that relates to it being based on um, a lot of different standards, whether the IT standards, um, also some standards that relate to more to cultural heritage information. And then some, this is more about functionality also that is, as you'll see, it has built-in uh, geospatial capabilities, you know, for, for um, recording location um, and interacting with, with other, for instance, GIS software, like Maggie mentioned. Um, and also, um, um, it's built so that security or access to data is very configurable, meaning that um, whoever implements the software can decide whether they want their data open, closed, partially open, so on. So I'm going to mention a few um, misconceptions that we often encounter, and uh, I just want to talk about them specifically because um, I don't want any misunderstandings in what I'm saying. So sometimes people think, oh, well, there's one kind of Uber arches that's collecting, one system collecting data from around the world, and maybe, maybe even the Getty has an interest in having that data. And that's not the case at all. So, Basically, we've developed this software code, and anyone can go. It's it's available online. Anyone can go download it, install it um, locally. Um, they can set it up on their own server or on the cloud and do what they want with it. We don't we don't know who downloads it, um, and this is just showing activity around the world of individual institutions or projects who have been using Arches that we're aware of, and they've download the code and done the things that I just mentioned. Um, we've also encountered there are some misconceptions about what open source means. And sometimes, sometimes people think that open source means open data. And those are two totally different things. So open source is about software, that the code is open and it's also free. Open meaning you can, you can get the code, you can change the code, and the code is free. Open data is totally different. 
Um, so with open source software, as I mentioned, you can make the data only internal, you can have it be all open, you can make certain parts of it open uh, to certain individuals, maybe with certain login credentials. Um, and we've also heard some, some arguments against open source software. These might be more philosophical arguments. Um, is it free? Um, and also, you get what you pay for, which is nothing. <laughs> so what we would say is, you know, it's not free like a beer. It's more free like, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but like a, like a puppy, you know. It's something you have to look, look after, you know, you have to take care of. Um, so once you download the software code, um, you'll probably need a database manager um, who's going to have to, um, you might have to administer users, you need it either a server or a cloud um, server services to host it on, uh, if, if different web browsers are you know, you get new versions of web browsers, new versions of operating systems for servers and so on. You've got to, you've got to um, update the software to uh, accommodate those things. So, um, you know, it, it's not, um, it's not sort of, there are costs that you'll, you'll need to entail for keeping it up, um, for, you know, managing it and so on. And about the bit about you get what you pay for, we say that um, this is actually a, pro a project that we've invested um, multi million dollars in over multiple years. And um, we would say, no, you get what we've paid for. <laughs> so, and, and we think we think it's a good system. Um, so what's what's in it for us? As I mentioned, we don't we don't want anyone's data and we're not getting anyone's data. Well, it's, it's really about our mission, which is about um, conservation of cultural resources. So we see inventories as really, you know, one of those kind of bread and butter tools to protect heritage. So our ultimate goal is improve her cultural resource management through more effective inventory systems. Um, so let me get a, a bit more just looking at arches and um, Um, first of all, um, you, you as let's say you've, you've implemented arches, um, and it's, it's not, it, I'll say right now, it's not a, an app that you click a button and, um, it's automatically downloaded. Um, and, um, Caitlin and I were talking a bit earlier, earlier, and she had, Encountered some difficulties, and I don't. I don't know if you've gotten to the point of trying to install arches. Yeah. <laughs> so really, this is um, what what would be called an enterprise level software system. So it's intended for organizational use. Um, it's intended to be installed on a server, or as I said, it could be cloud based services. You know, like Amazon Web Services or Azure, which is Microsoft's version of that. Um, you would would really to it's not um i would say that you know if your background might be in i don't know architecture or um you're a conservator or something like that i would say you you likely will be frustrated trying to set it up because it's really the kind of thing that someone who's comfortable with installing and setting up enterprise level software would would need to get involved with so I just want to put that out there up front. Um, but once you've once you've got it set up and installed, and, and that's kind of a one-time um, investment, really, to get it set up. Um, you know, you can you can uh, decide who you want to provide access to. So you can essentially set up different, let's say, user groups. You might allow, let's say, if you want to make data public publicly accessible, you might. Um, allow some data to be open to to anyone, you know, like the city of LA, they've implemented Arches as historic places in LA, and you can go to the site and explore the data. Um, 
you might um, have certain trusted users that they're given credentials to edit information, create information. Um, you would probably have a, a separate user who is a database administrator. You might have a, a particular user, I'm gonna mention, um, setting up all the what are called controlled vocabularies in the system, which are really the drop-down menus, um, someone to, to be responsible for, for that and modifying those things. Um, so you have that kind of control um, built in and actually down to the le level of the data field. So you can expose um, particular data fields, but not other data fields if you want. All right, um, and this is kind of a typical uh, data entry screen. Um, and we've tried to make, make it as easy as possible to use. So you don't need to be, for, for, for instance, you don't need to be versed or trained up in using GIS to interact with the system. You know, the idea is to allow as, as, as much um, access as possible for whether it's for searching or for creating data and so on. And the default version of Arches, I mentioned that you can, you can customize it or modify it. So there is a, a default version that you download. And the way we've set it up is when you go in, you can choose different kinds of what we call resources to create within the system. And this little drop, drop down here shows where you can pick which type of resource you want to create or which kind of record you want to create in the system. Um, so these are the, the six essential um, kinds of records that you can create in the default version of the system. So historic resources, that's what we all tend to be focused on, you know, the building, the site, the landscape, so on. Um, and then also districts, or it could be any grouping of historic resources. They don't need to be all clustered together. Um, it could be a thematic grouping. Um, also people or organizations could be, for instance, an architect, could be um, a, a, um, a preservation firm or government agency, it could be a cultural group. Um, historical events, you can create records for those. Um, activities, so that might be a survey or some other kind of intervention um, at a site, and also what we call information resources. So those could be documents, images, audio files, um, video files, and so on. And, and one of the really um, cool things that, that we like is we've used um, what I might call the new generation of information technology, like you see with Facebook or LinkedIn, where you go in and let's say on LinkedIn, you come across someone who you see as a third degree um, connection to you through other people. And Arches, um, the underlying graph database, is able to record similar kinds of relationships between these resources. So for example, you can um, record a historical event that's related to a certain historic resource or and you could also have a document it could be an image of that event that's also related so you can build and define these relationships between these types of records within the system and then you can also search you, you may search and find one thing and through the relationships you find out about a related event related person or so on so we think that there's a lot of power in that and also it, it can help for, um, for, for example, um, recording in the system what makes certain places significant. And this um, set of, um, uh, this list on the left, these, this is a, for historic resources, these are the, the ways you can describe that resource. So you, you can add a description, you can add a location, actually multiple types of locations, could be an address, could be a geometry, could be cadastral information. Um, 
different components, or you can have condition assessments, um, images or files. Uh, you can um, create relationships with other resources there. You can refer to that resource in other information systems. Um, you can record designations. So this is um, this example is a Hollyhock House, which is from Los Angeles. You know, Frank Franklin Wright um, building, and um, here you see you can enter multiple names for resource. Um, for instance, the National Register um, listing calls it the the, the site that Barnsdale Park. So if you search the system, you can find it under any one of those names, and you can. Um, also, assign a type to the name. There might be a preferred name, there might be a national register name, and so on. You can drag and drop files, the different kind of files I mentioned, or just um, upload those relating to a record. Um, you can, uh, as I mentioned, you can record the geometry. Um, and. You know, it's it's pretty straightforward. You don't again. You don't need GIS training to do this. Here, you can choose either um, a point line or polygon that you want to add, um, or you can add a GPX file. It would be from a GPS unit. You can basically drag that over. Um, so this is showing recording a, uh, a geometry. For the building, and you can indicate the kind of polygon that is. In this case, it's a footprint polygon, footprint of the of the building. Um, and this is just showing that um, it, through um, we worked with the city of Los Angeles to implement arches um, there, and, and which relates back to our involve, involvement with the Survey LA project and realizing, hey, we have tens of thousands of records and something needs to be done with this data. Um, and that led to um, importing that data in Arches and now it's available and searchable online. Um, but what I was, the point I was getting to, this shows um, a workflow for evaluating resources in terms of um, National Register, California Register, and also local. Um, eligibility criteria and also integrity. Um, that's the that's the result. So when you when you look at historic places LA, which is the city of Los Angeles version of Arches, you'll see um, you won't have access to the work, workflow to create information, but you will see the results of those evaluations there. Um, just one other thing is that you can, when you're setting up arches, you can, um, let, let me move from what I was just showing was, was about data creation. And those would um, might be certain trusted users. Let me move now to, to looking at searching for information. So um, one thing that you can do is for your particular case, you can, you can uh, set up particular, let's say, um, they might be popular searches that for the public you set up where they go there and they're already set up for someone to go. In this case, this is Historic Places LA. Um, you can immediately go to all the National Register listed properties or all their local districts, which they call Historic Preservation Overlay Zones or um, all their local landmark buildings. Um, do do the, those locations come pre-installed in the package that you download as arches, or do you have to import them um, after installing the software and, and the database and everything? Basically, um, there's a step with arches that in um, technically is called configuration. Mm -hmm. So let's say you've installed the software and at the configuration step, you might add a, add a logo, like here there's a Historic Places LA logo there. Right. Um, or certain 
certain other information about the name of your system and the organization that um, has implemented the system. And on this page, this is, which is called popular searches, this is something that as the organization setting up your ARCS instance, you would define what popular searches you wanted to show up there. Okay. That's basically based on your data. And I'm assuming what you think would be popular with users to the system. Right, I, I guess to follow up on that is, um, yeah. we've collected uh, information on a number of different types of historic resources from National Register. Um, resources. Mm -hmm. We have links to the uh, NPS uh, PDF for each resource in the state mm -hmm. and we also have extracted some of the text for the description for that resource for something like 2,000 historic places right. um, that are listed on the National Register. Right. But when you install Arches onto your own server, mm -hmm. that data probably has to be imported and, and um, mapped mm -hmm. somehow to the arches database right that's right and and if, if you have legacy data yeah yeah you would, you would need to um prepare it to to import so get it into the right format and you might have some data cleanup that you need to do right and then once you have that data imported into the system you could set up let's say a search like this so they're, they're let's say for national register properties, um, there's probably going to be a field under designation yeah. for National Register listing. So that saved query would basically be pointing at that field and all values that have a yes, um, all records that have a yes value there would would be returned. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, great. That answers my question, I guess. I'm just curious how um, if you're working with outside data that may not necessarily mm -hmm. match the schema mm -hmm. of arches, yeah. is there a tool in arches that allows you to match up the two and say, mm -hmm. okay, designation right. means in this other database, designation mm -hmm. is called, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I don't know what, <laughs> but right. it's a different name for the column. Right. And is there anything that allows you to easily match up those two columns? Right. Yeah, I think that relates maybe to two different things. And one is about importing data and getting preparing data for import. Yeah. And part of that is about defining what what the controlled vocabularies are, what the vocabularies are, um, and what fields those particular vocabularies relate to. You know, you might have a vocabulary for material conditions that relates to a condition or materials field. And you might have a designation right. field that has a certain list of terms for that field. Yeah. Um, but there is a a built-in sort of um, tool within Arches called the Reference Data Manager, where you're you're able to set up and manage those kinds of controlled vocabularies. Okay. And it basically work works on a concept basis. So let me try to give a simple example. Um, so a concept might be a house. And you, there may be many multiple names for house. You know, there might be a townhouse, mm -hmm. cottage. Um, you know, you can think of all potential variants. Some of them may be subcategories, but basically, what you can do is you can tie together different terms that all relate to one concept. Okay. So, for instance, your example, there may be equivalent terms. Um, or variant terms that you could all relate to one concept. Um, or it might be a data issue where you, you might need to actually um, just work on the raw file that you're importing. Yeah, you might, yeah. you might need to work on the raw data that you're gonna import, and you might need to transform certain, let's say, da data values so that they're all um, consistent before importing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. So yeah. what you're saying Caitlin. is that when you're trying to add data into Arches, you need to predefine what all of your inputs could be before you can input anything. That, is. That's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Can you go back and change it? Later? You can. You can. Um, you would need to think through if that will have any implications 
uh, regarding the data that's in the system if, you, if you're changing things. Um, but yeah, you can think of it as kind of, you know, you might have a legacy data set, maybe from an old system, or maybe you have no system. Maybe it was just co collected data that was not in a database. And let's say that's a legacy data set on one hand, and then Arches would be kind of the target database that um, eventually that this data needed to be imported into. But you need to establish first what your target database is going to look like um, before you import that. You know, basically think through, okay, so what what do I want eventually want my data ultimately look like, you know, uh, before you start importing data. Okay, so let me just go back to this. This is really showing how search works in Arches. So I'm going to use the example of what's called Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monuments, which is one of these popular searches, the one in the upper left. Um, so let's say that you chose that um, search. So you get a return and um, you may not be able to read it, but there are 1,080 results. So 1,080 historic cultural monuments in Los Angeles. And basically you can scroll, if you want to, you can scroll through all those records. Um, but we can, what you can really do is you can build a search. So you can add multiple, multiple criteria, one after the other. Um, in this case, um, what I'm gonna show is instead you can also Let's, um, we, we got our search return for historic cultural monuments, and now let's look at that data spatially. So here you go to the map, and as I'm gonna explain a bit later, there's a new version of Arches where these two things are combined in search, um, searching on a term and searching on the map. But, but anyway, this is showing historic places in LA as an example, um, and that was, that's Arches version three rather than version four. Anyway, I'll explain that later. So this shows on the map where all those um, resources are located and it clusters certain resources. And as you zoom in, those clusters disaggregate. So let's look at, let's zoom in, and this is looking at Wilshire Boulevard. And right now there's a um, extension of the Purple Line subway in Los Angeles. And let's just hypothetically look at, let's search along the path of that plan development to see you know, what might the impact be on any historic cultural monuments. So you can do a search along that path with the location filter. You can choose a point, line, or polygon to draw on the screen um, to define, let's say, a project area. In this case, we'll choose a, a line just down Wilshire Boulevard since the subways being constructed under Wilshire Boulevard. Um, so from v Vermont Avenue to Fairfax, and then you can buffer that line or point or polygon, and we'll buffer by 2,000 feet. So it's narrowed down from 1,080 records now to 41 records. And then you can ex start exploring those individual resources that turned up in that search to see you know, how significant are they? What, what are those particular resources? Um, and then there's a third kind of dim dimension you can add as a criterion, which is time. So here you can, um, this is what's called the time filter, then um, add a criterion for all resources with a, with a date, um, which may be construction date before, from before 1942. So that narrows it down to 18 resources. So really what you can do is build these kind of searches to explore the data. And you can also um, select one of those search um, criteria to negate it. So um, you could look at all um, resources that have been recorded in the system that are not historical cultural monuments, or you can really negate anything you want. So it just, I think it gives you flexibility in exploring the data in some powerful ways. Um, and next, um, I just wanted to show um, 
demonstrate these kind of relationships that I mentioned that you can define within the data between records. So this example, uh, I'm going to use a person as a type of resource to search on. So in this case, it's Paul Williams, who, as many of you know, was a prominent architect in Los Angeles. He was the first um, African-American member of the um, AIA in the US, as I understand it. And um, so just searching on his name in the system, you can see um, there's Paul Williams as a keyword. You can add keywords if you want. Here's his record as a person or organization. So we're gonna we're gonna select that record. Um, you find his record, and then there's something called related resources that you can choose that you can select there. And what that does is it brings up a what's essentially a graph showing these kind of nodes within a graph showing different resource records in the system that are related to Paul Williams. And as you start exploring those, you can um, look at, well, what are those resources? So in this case, the 28th Street YMCA building. And it shows Paul Williams designed and 28th Street YMCA building was designed by. So in the system, it you can define the type of re relationship between resources. Um, so a lot of these are, are particular um, buildings that he was involved in the design of. Um, there are a number of buildings in the system that he was designed, involved in the design of, like the Angeles Funeral Home. Um, there's a Los Angeles uh, First African Methodist Church. Um, and I wanted to focus on one called the Nicolosi Estate, which is named after someone named Joseph Nicolosi. So if you then click on one of those nodes, you can look, remember I mentioned like LinkedIn, you can see second, third degree relationships. Well, you can do the same thing here. So if you click on that node, some other people come up. In this case, there's Johnny Weissmuller who, who commissioned the building and many of you may have heard of him. He was, um, you may have known know of him as the actor who played Tarzan, but he was also an Olympic swimmer very successful. Joseph Nicolosi, who, who it's named after. And then you also see Mick Jagger, who his relationship is, um, it shown, shows that Johnny Weissmuller and uh, Joseph Nicolosi owned uh, the resource at different times and Mick Jagger, Jagger occupied it. So at one point in time, he lived there. So um, as I mentioned, through these, defining these kind of relationships and exploring them, you can, um, some of these things do feed into how you can assess and define significance of resources. And you know, I think it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing for, could be researchers, the public, or so on. Um, so let me move on to just a bit about um, who's using arches and in what ways to give you an idea of that. This is just showing the known activity, um, the activity that we know about around the world of different organizations or projects using arches. Um, the dots in red, if you can make them out, those are um, live implementations. Um, a lot of them are public, some of them are, are private. Um, the ones in orange are implementations that are in, in process. And then in green are um, evaluations that, that we're aware of, of the software. So these are some different organizations um, that have implemented or are in the process of implementing ARCHES. I mentioned the city of LA. Um, the city and county of San Francisco right now is, is um, laying the groundwork to implement ARCHES. They're, they're um, organizing a large scale survey now and their plan is to implement ARCHES to manage and make available that, that data and other data. Um, Queen Anne's County, Maryland um, has implemented ARCHES. They haven't launched it yet. As I understand, they're still entering data. Um, the Kingdom of Bhutan has, has implemented ARCHES. It's not public uh, right now. Um, Armed Forces Retirement Home, I'll show you a bit of what that looks like. That's a federal 
agency in Washington, D.C. that's uh, a National Historic Landmark. Um, historic England, City of Lincoln in, in England, um, I'll mention those in just a moment. Um, we're work, doing some work with both of them. So those are all government agencies. These are some uh, more academic um, organizations or nonprofits. Um, the, the Oxford University, um, they're using it for, it's a pretty large scale project. To re, it's called Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa. And it's over 20, 20 countries. They're, they're recording archaeological sites that um, they deem to be at risk. And um, they have over 100,000 records in their system. Part of their data is available online. I just call that out because um, there are organizations using it for archaeological um, resources, um, like the ASOR, American Schools of Ordinal Research. That's a project with the US State Department where they're recording um, heritage in Syria and Iraq and Libya. Um, Cane River National Heritage Area, I'll show you that. That's in Louisiana. That's, that's up and live. Um, some universities in Hong Kong, Slovenia, Taiwan, Florida. So these are, um, I thought I'd just show you just some screenshots from some other Arches implementations so you can just get an idea. You saw a bit of Historic Place LA. These are, this is Cane River National Heritage Area. So basically they've, they put their own logo, their own welcome message, um, their own rotating images. Of course, they have their own data. Um, they've added uh, several historic maps that you can basically you can explore the data in relation to different historic maps which is interesting there including looking at historical land ownership they've also added some um, audio recordings of uh, oral histories that relate to certain records and um, also a, a large cemetery which it's really interesting when you're able to to find these different relationships between for instance cemetery markers or monuments and people buried there there may be multiple people buried there and you can relate then those people or monuments or markers to let's say a building that they used to own or inhabit um, this is the armed forces retirement home so this is more a sort of campus and they're using it um, kind of at more for asset management and compliance with different um, really federal federal laws or, or regulations since they're a federal agency. Um, that's also live now. Um, I mentioned Historic England, so we're working with them right now to, they're, they manage the um, Greater London inventory, which is called a historic environment record there. So right now they're, they're um, preparing to move from an older system to arches and the older system, the data is not really public. You can, you can get some data through another means, but, um, and that, that, that's an exciting thought, just having all that rich data um, made publicly accessible. Um, and City of Lincoln, we're also working with them right now. They're, they're going to be implementing next year first and um, um, and London after them. So these are just some new developments included in, I mentioned a new version, version four. Um, so ver I, I mentioned to Caitlin that version four is complete. I should say that actually um, th that documentation of the software is still being completed. It, it, it was just um, just completed and I think there are probably some kinks still being worked out, but I wanted to mention some of the, some of the new features with that. Um, really, we've tried to lower the bar for organizations to set up and customize the software so they don't have to um, have as much of a need for software coding. Um, Really, you can, um, Maggie, you were asking about, can you, for instance, add fields and things like that? So with version four, you'll be able to, let's say, add fields, for example, without any coding um, required. There's basically, there's basically, 
a user interface where you'll be able to do that. And you add a field and then you see it appear um, automatically in, let's say, resource reports. Um, so we think that's pretty cool. Also, some tools that, to help um, with importing and exporting of data to make that easier. Um, also, a tool to internally manage um, maps or satellite um, aerial imagery, satellite imagery, where you can have that data locally um, instead of having it be what's called a service like Google Maps, in Maps, or so on. And um, so also some improvements to search. So, for example, here you, this is version four, and it's integrated that. Um, text search bar, which is searching by a term or attribute with the map. So those things are now integrated. Um, and next year, um, the work on this has already begun. Um, we'll be completing development of a an Arches um, mobile data collection app that will be usable either offline or online. You know going to have a network connection or not, record the data, and then basically, basically, let's say you get back to somewhere where you have a connection, it will allow you to sync up with your Arches instance and import that data. Um, and there's something else called a um, data collection project manager that will basically allow you to, let's say you're going to do a survey for a discrete area. Um, and you're going to have certain um, individuals or groups involved in collecting data. There will be some tools there to, to basically allow you to d define that area, um, you, um, to easily give access to, let's say, hire a consulting firm, just to access and maybe to certain data fields um, for that area and certain base maps for that discrete area and so on to help make those data collection efforts easier. And um, also some tools to make managing users easier. So if you'd like to find out more, I would recommend going to archesproject.org. Um, that's the project website. Um, at a first level, there's a demo site there. So that will allow you to see the data creation and editing side of Arches, um, which, um, you know, if you're looking at these public instances of Arches, like Historic Places LA, you don't see that. Um, we're now in the process of, that demo is currently the version three demo. We're preparing a version four demo, um, which should be coming soon. Um, and there's also an important page there <laughs> on the website called Implementation Considerations. So this is, it's sort of a list of things to think about before you, if you're considering um, using Arches. So, um, and these are based on input from people who have, who have implemented Arches. So I'll, I'll just go through a basic list of them. And this is a web page on the website. Um, you know, one, the first one is, do you want to host the software on, your own server or in the cloud. Your organization might have some institutional requirements around that. Um, you're gonna have to think about ongoing maintenance of the software, but also administration of users, a data manager, those kinds of things. Um, do you have legacy data or not? If you do, you'll need to think about getting that data in shape to import. Um, as I mentioned, you'll need to think about what, what your um, drop down should be um, and get those um, defined in the system. And there's that tool that allows you to do that. Um, do you need to customize the software? Do you need to add any fields? Do you want to hide any fields? Um, do you want to extend the software? So those are all things that you'll, you'll want to think about. And then, as I mentioned, you also need to, there will be a configuration step well, where you'll want to define the base map that you look at. You'll want to define what base map layers you want to 
you want to use in the system or integrate. Um, at, you know, put up, put add your own branding or logos and images and text and all those sorts of things. Um, so those are those are all things that you would want to think about. Um, just trying to think of if there's anything anything else. Um, yeah, I think I think those are those are kind of the the the, the big big things you'd want to think about. So from there, there's also an online um, community forum which is a Google group, anyone can join it. We have about, I think about 360 members there now from around the world, but that's really a place that um, a lot of the queries there are people who are installing the software and maybe they encounter a problem, something like that. Maybe it turns out that they loaded um, the wrong version of what's called a dependency, which is you need to load a certain set of softwares that are integrated within arches, those kind of things. So um, as a first step, you'd want to look there to see if someone else has already posted that question and it's already been answered. Um, and once again, this, this is where you can go for more information, but um, I'd be happy to an answer any questions now. Thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> if you could, you repeating the questions that are asked by uh, sure. people. Uh, so what if um, what if for what if you have a lot of information that has um, that's all over the country or say all over just the state and mm -hmm. has uh, different evaluative criteria per resource like per per local register? Mm -hmm. um, would you then add every single type of evaluative criteria to its to say if you're doing it for the state um, in order in order to encompass all of it or can you specify that per mm -hmm. resource that it does make sense um i'm not sure i've thought about that question before I'm, i don't know that we've encountered that need yet but um i'm just trying to think i you know i would think that you could basically build um Basically, the data structure behind Arches is what's called a graph data structure, and and there are different branches, what are called branches of that. And let's say one branch would be about designation. So there you're going to have fields or what are called nodes for a type of designation. You know, is it National Register, California Register, so on. The date of registration uh, or designation, and so on, and then. For each field, you can define sets of vocabularies, and those can be hierarchical. So you're going to have a, let's say, a primary, you know, a primary value and kind of child values, if you want to call them that. So I'm just thinking it through. You you might be able to through the vocabularies, you might be able to choose. Um, I don't know if you're thinking of like different cities. Yeah. Um, you might be able to choose, okay, well, this evaluation was done in, let's say, Riverside. So these are their um, options for criteria that you can choose from. So you might be able to build that through vocabularies um, versus if you're doing an evaluation for a resource in um, Palo Alto, there might be other criteria. So it automatically sort of filters it out? Um, I think you could probably build the vocabularies that that way but um i think you'd, you'd have to actually um that that's just thinking it through off the top of my head you know i think you would actually have to um work that out in the system that that's what i would would envision envisage for for dealing with that i'll ask a question um I'm actually really interested in the public facing side of arches and how um, it could potentially allow for sort of community curation um, and crowdsourcing mm -hmm. and how can the how can the public I know you said there were different user access levels and say mm -hmm. somebody goes to a public facing website they see a site that they know about down their block 
and they'd like to share a uh, photo of their grandmother standing in front of the house or something. Right. Um, is it does Arches allow for that? And and how does how would how can you um, how can you customize the website to display that content? Right. <clears throat> um, well, especially through version four, we've we've thought more about that sort of thing. So on one hand, you might, let's say you might have a crowdsourced um, data collection effort. Um, so through that, what's called a um, data collection project manager, through that you could, let's say, you could, you could identify certain subgroup of, of users that would be creating data through that effort. You could assign them different roles. Some of them might be more, let's say, trusted users. Um, they might be, let's say, if, if a city's doing it, they might be a, um, a consultant that is a specialist versus a member of the public who's not a specialist. So based on those different roles, you could define both what data fields they could have access to. So maybe a consultant, you give them access to the evaluation um, fields to actually evaluate a resource in terms of, um, let's say, National Register. Whereas for a volunteer member of the public, you might just give them access to more descriptive fields. Um, so that could be one way of dealing with that. Um, but really, you can, um, you can determine, um, let's just say that if someone is, you have people who are coming to the site from the web, and your example of they have a photo that, that they would like to contribute. You could set it up so that um, members of the public could, um, it, it could be maybe they contact you and you grant them a, let's say, a, a user role to contribute information. Um, or it could just be open. You could allow open access to the public to enter and create data. Um, I think that that would, would probably um, entail some risks in terms of your data data management potentially. Um, but with version four, something that you can do is basically you can set up a kind of it, it's kind of like an hold a holding area where data that you have contributed, let's say through a crowdsourcing effort. It, it might not be officially blessed, so it might need to be reviewed. Um, but that's kind of an intermediary, intermediary step that you can set up to have data submitted and then reviewed. And then if it's um, determined to be valid, then you go ahead and approve the, approve the record for them. OK. Thank you. Um, there was an, a question online um, from Elaine. And she's asking if there's any other sort of technical support, or would you recommend anybody that can provide technical support other than the Google group that you mentioned? Um, there is a page on the website under development that is um, identify certain service providers that have, I would say, sort of proved themselves, their capabilities in implementing arches. And um, so there are certain companies identified there. There are um, other organizations that have been involved in setting up arches that, that aren't identified there. So that, that's going to be a growing list. Um, and um, for instance, in the UK, there, there are some right now who are going to be supporting those implementations there. Um, so I would look there first. and. Um, they could also contact contact um, me or um, they could post on the forum say hey i'm looking for a service provider for arches i'm located here um, uh, describe their project a bit and see who responds so there there are there are different ways to to look for for that kind of support okay any questions from the room oh yeah um 
For the relationships, do you, is, is that something that the software does automatically, or do you have to set those tags up? Do you have to determine to find the relationship, or will it, will it sort of think that out and figure it out after you set up? Basically, you're you're like all the other drop downs in the system. You're able to define the kind of um, possible relationships, and um, I think what you would do is define certain relationships that are logical between certain resource types. You know, so for example, that Paul Williams example, one of the drop downs was designed, um, and that may relate to role of an architect for example so you would want to there are some um default values that when you download the software that are already there for people to kind of get started with but they should take a look at those values themselves and see if they're valid for their own case or do they <clears throat> do they want to um define any any other relationships additional or um change them um, but you do you do need to um, in the data you need to create those relationships between resources um, kind of like linkedin you know once you create one relationship here and let's say someone else there are two resources someone else re uh, creates a relationship uh, to one of those resources to another one then those are three resources are now related, you know. So um, it, it kind of you can have kind of um, disparate um, instances where people are defining resources, and those can can kind of um, you you can basically build a web of re re relationships through those disparate instances, you know. If that makes sense. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a lot of deals, but um, <laughs> I was going to ask you later. Um, I, I love the way that um, it looks at relationships, and I'm wondering if there's other ways that you can use the data to see trends and patterns other than relationships. Like there's other uses of data. Right. Um, Sorry, I realize I haven't been repeating questions, so let me just repeat that one. So the question was, um, are there ways to use the software to um, to look at trends or patterns in the data? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, there are. So, for example, one thing you could do is um, you can record in, through condition assessments, you can record let's say particular disturbances to sites. And let's say you're looking at archeological sites and you're recording, um, let's say different people around a region have been recording um, looting disturbances to sites. And that condition assessment um, is done on a certain date. <clears throat> and if you've done certain, you know, assessments over time, hopefully you might be able to pinpoint during what time span that disturbance occurred. So what you're able to do is search across the system to see <clears throat> where looting disturbances have occurred. It could, you could look at that geographically, or you could look at that in, in a time, sense of time, or both together. That's one example. Um, I know another thing that's come up with um, Los Angeles, because Survey LA has been such a big project over a number of years with a lot of <coughs> several different consulting firms involved, and it's such a big city, which set with such um, diverse resources, I think it's been really valuable to now have that data in one system where you can search across that data to look at for, let's say, buildings of certain typologies or from certain periods. So I think there's a lot of power in being able to aggregate all that data and then search across it in, um, in kind of rich ways to then look for, look for patterns, you know, and I think that can then inform things like um, con context, um, you know, historic context, where you may have thought that a certain resource type, um, that there were quite a few of them left, but then through that information, you might see better what the rarity is of a certain type or look at more at the geographic uh, spread of certain categories of resources. <clears throat> 
Well, I have one more question that I, I had in mind if nobody else does. Um, I heard that you said there was one of your uh, clients, or I guess um, customers of arches, and don't want to call them clients or customers because it's free, um, but uh, 100,000 records. So to deal with that much data on a web server sometimes can be wieldy and, and um, can tax your server and, and mm -hmm. decrease the speed of your other services. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you use things like clustering and some of these other methods to sort of speed up the processing power of, but have mm -hmm. any of uh, your users experienced any um, performance issues uh, right. in processing that much data? Right. Um, I, I'll, I'll only speak to what I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, that particular instance, the, the project out of Oxford, um, I think maybe there have been some issues, but it's been more related to uh, their network speed as opposed to the, the database. Right. Um, I know that um, with version four, one of the things, one of the things that um, has been approved is also the performance of things like you're talking about. Um, but I think that that's a question that um, would be a good one for to put on the forum there. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's kind of what I'm what I'm aware of. I'm, I'm not. Um, I've heard the software developers, you know, address that question pretty often and. Their answer is that uh, they're, they're, that that hasn't been an issue, but um, I think in some cases it depends on you know what your what your network speed is, what kind of um, firewalls you have set up, and where whether there are other factors that are impinging on the speed. Right. Uh, but I, I think the the forum is a good place to pose that kind of question. Okay.